This is a production of Cornell University. Hi, my name is Matra Mespelnikov, and I'm the Director of Undergraduate Studies in the English Course. And I'm here to welcome you to Books Sandwiched In. Um, I also teach uh, medieval English literature for the most part, uh, plus it's class right now on the body. So you may very well see me for your pre hundred requirement if you're a major. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm here today to introduce Greg Londy, who is among many other things, the newest hire in the English department, and we're so excited to have him join us. Um, Greg is a graduate, most recently, of Princeton University, where he earned his PhD in 2011, and also of Washington University in St. Louis, where he got his MA and BA. I have to note that's an excellent English department. They interviewed me. I love them. Yeah, they're uh, uh, and he is, he is currently at work on a book called Enduring Modernism, Forms of Surviving Location in the 20th Century Long Poem. Because Book Sandwich Din is actually an informal event to introduce English majors to our faculty, we have actually asked some faculty to join us for free lunch. Um, and we will be around after Greg stops speaking for a little while to chat with you, answer your questions, not necessarily questions of a technical literary nature, but also the kinds of things that we talk about at this event, which is like what we love about reading and what we love about the teaching of literature. So we're here, and I'm going to just gesture quickly at who the other faculty present here are. This is Roger Gilbert, the ch currently the chair of the department. Um, Aishan Hutchinson, <laughs> whose mouth is full. Uh, <laughs> Raina Callis, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Marco Crawford, and uh, Rogers actually. Going to be David Orr. Well, uh, yes, I just want to welcome David Orr, who is not currently a member of the English department, but will be as of next year, and he is the author of a great so book. So we'll make him do one of these. Yes, he will be doing this. I mean, <laughs> uh, he's the author of a great book called Beautiful and Pointless: A Guide to Modern Poetry, and we're just really thrilled that you're going to be teaching um, in the English department uh, starting next year. So. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I just I mean, look for his classes uh, when you're signing up in the spring for the uh, for, for for next fall. Well, good to see you guys. Without further ado, Greg. Hey everyone, thanks so much for being here. Um, thanks, Masha. Thanks, Roger, for inviting me. Uh, thanks, David, for not doing this before I did because everyone read David's writing; it's amazing, and you can see why I wouldn't want to follow that up. Um, um, and, and also, if some of you might have been here last month when Jenny Mann gave this talk. Um, so though she's not here, thanks to Jenny, because she gave this beautiful sort of intellectual autobiography of, of how she got to the work that she does. And when I was asked to do this, I was, at, I was sort of thinking about how did I get here? And I'm still brand new, so I don't know that I have a clear answer to that. But um, a title popped into my head when I was asked, which is the title that you've probably seen, the, the tightrope and the typewriter. Um, I think it's safe to say probably that we're all here for one, uh, in one way or another because someone told us a story that mattered to us in some way, whether it was a person we knew or um, a poet or a novelist. Um, so the title is meant to signal two stories that mattered to me that somehow brought me to teaching poetry today. Uh, but one's a story in which I, as a child, would participate, and the other is a story that came out of silence, uh, that came out of what had to be unspoken in my family for a long time. When I was a kid, my grandfather, uh, Edward Londy, Eddie, uh, some people called him Eddie the Lion, he would tell me stories of the circus. We're talking like when I was about three, so I would just be sitting perched on the edge of the couch. And he would tell me about the lion tamer sticking his head in the lion's mouth. He would act all these things out. He would tell me about the, um, the juggling clowns, even though he couldn't juggle. So there were always these kind of sad clowns that were like, bad at their jobs. Um, and, and he had one routine that I remember being, it's my first memory of someone telling me a story. Um, he had this routine, he called the tightrope routine, where he would walk the line of the edge of a rug on the living room floor, and he would, grandly announced that he needed absolute silence. He'd say, I need absolute silence from the audience. The tightrope walker is going to, for the first time, be walking without a net 200 feet in the air. 
If he falls, he will plummet to his death. No sound can be uttered by the audience. Please, absolute quiet. And somehow I knew as a three-year-old uh, that this meant that I should yell at some point. <laughs> uh, so he would, he would start out, and he would be sort of doing this, and I would just be there waiting to kill him. And just, <laughs> sort of, so, absolute stillness and quiet, and the qu house would be completely quiet. And then I would just go, ah! And he would pretend to fall and do, ah! Um, and I asked, the other, about a week ago, I asked my brother if he remembered this routine. And he said, oh yeah, the great achoo. <laughs> I was like, so he had an, an ironic, self-defeating name, this acrobat, this sort of terrible acrobat. Um, and I guess had acquired that name in the five years between when I was hearing the story and when my brother was hearing the story. Um, but I sort of think, and this may be too grandiose to say, that that yelling out, that little, ah, was probably my first act of literary criticism in some way. <laughs> um, or when I think of it now, I think about the ways that we interact with the stories that we hear, um, how we change them by responding, uh, how they solicit our hollering out or our applause or our questions. Um, the real story of my grandfather's side of the family is a story of forced immigration during the time of the Warsaw pogroms, 1881. Um, but to hear my grandfather tell stories about our family was to feel like our family was out of a magic realist novel. Um, our last name, bafflingly pronounced Londi instead of Lond, uh, and we have no French origins. I don't know where this name came from, but he would say it came from De Leon, and that we were descended from uh, Spanish Jewish mystics, and that we were a family of uh, court poets to the czars in Russia. And he told me about my great great uncle, Izzy Londi, who was a famous St. Louis gangster. And it just, I mean, this all, these all seemed like the Irish would call an Irish bull. Um, in the Jewish Italian mafia, Egan's Rats in St. Louis. And he told the story that when he got home from the war, he fought in the Pacific in World War II. When he got home from the war, he was uh, trying to support his siblings and his mother. His father had passed away when he was quite young. And so desperate for money, he went to Izzy Londi, this sort of dying gangster in a flea-bitten room at the end of a life of crime and said, look, I need some, I need to get into the mob. Like, can you give me some, some ways in, some contacts? And Izzy Londi gave this phlegmy retort, of, get out of here, he crumpled a hundred dollar bill and threw it at my grandpa's chest. It's like, get out of here and don't waste your life the way I did. If you ever touch the mob, I will get out of this bed and I will kill you myself. And I thought that this was just a kind of a parable, like a story about um, how I shouldn't lead a life of crime. Obviously, he'd seen that as a three-year-old, I had a tendency to uh, homicide or <laughs> manslaughter. <laughs> so maybe he was trying to you know, warn me off of that. And then uh, shortly after my grandfather passed away, I was in a used bookstore in St. Louis. And right up there by the counter, they had this self-printed book called St. Louis Gangsters with a lineup on the front. And one of the faces in that lineup was a very familiar looking head, like the same kind of peanut head that my grandfather and my dad, everyone in my family has once we start losing our hair. It was the same face, and it was Izzy Londi, and it's, this was some real thing. I mean, he's a terrible guy. He threw a bomb in a car. So. Um, but uh, yeah, I grew up in St. Louis. Um, moved to Chicago when my dad switched jobs, and then I went back to St. Louis to go to Washington University. Wonderful place that it is. I became, while well, I was there, kind of obsessed with writers who were from St. Louis, uh, T.S. Eliot, Tennessee Williams, um, uh, Kate Chopin, William S. Burroughs, Mark Twain, who in a little sort of factoid preview of uh, where I'm going in this talk, his novel, Tom Sawyer, was actually the first literary, the first typescript of a novel. He had a Remington and his Sanchoff's publisher's first typescript. Um, but uh, my grandpa was definitely the most important writer I read during college. He would send me poems that he wrote every week, uh, first as letters, and then we got him a computer. He would email them to me every week, and we would go and get dinner or lunch once a weekend, and we would talk about what he'd written, what I was reading. Um, I was reading a lot of things that I knew that he would like, uh, and so bringing those to him. Um, he had a love of Borges, who I told him about. Um, told him about how I learned from one of my Spanish professors that when Borges came to St. Louis, 
he was blind and near the end of his life, and when asked, what do you want to do in St. Louis, which is a loaded question, there's not a lot to do in St. Louis always, um, he had asked, he said, I want to put my hands in Mark Twain's river. I want to go to the Mississippi and put my hands in that river. Uh, which also, terrible idea. Things polluted as hell. <laughs> don't, don't follow blind Borges' advice on that. Um, so for my grandpa, I came to think of poems all through this time as things that came from dreams, uh, from a kind of divine something. Uh, his dreams were serene and beautiful. He would uh, lay there. My grandmother, my grandmother laying next to him, had nightmares most nights. Um, she would speak in German in her sleep, and he would sort of comfort her back to sleep. He would wake up and hold her. And when he woke up, he would write his dreams down so that he could share with her the, the better dreams that he was having um, and to sort of push back against the darkness that was in her sleep. So I was their second audience. Um, you have one of them. He published a few towards the end of his life in various journals. Um, it's on the second page of the handout. Uh, it was published in this collection, First Harvest, Jewish Writings in St. Louis. It's called The Tapestry of Prayers. On a plain surrounded by mountains whose majestic heights are haven to angels, a tapestry of prayers woven with exotics in Safed ascends at dawn each day. A cello, its baritone voice, can be heard echoing through the canyons. A beautiful note held eternally. Its colors are as tides on a pristine beach on an undiscovered island. Listening, we can hear their hymns of praise to our father. The sun rays frolic upon the peaks as young mountain goats in spring, then kiss each peak as a mother kisses her children when they sleep. When we die, we become stars in the sky. My grandma, Martha, is 90 now. Um, she survived my grandfather now by nine years. Um, her vision's almost completely gone. Her hearing is, is almost completely gone. Uh, her mind is kind of going. And she speaks German frequently. Her German has just come back to her. So when people come to the house, she'll just be speaking in the German that she spoke as a girl. She grew up in Austria. Um, I realize this is a little heavy for a lunchtime talk, but I promise it'll get, <laughs> get out of the hall. I, I recently learned that she loved Goethe as a child. Um, she had won a prize of Goethe's poems for being the top student in her class and just grew up loving them. And uh, this is the, actually the first I ever heard of my grandmother reading poetry or having any experience of poetry just a couple weeks ago. So my, I found out about this because my dad has now hired an Austrian grad student to come and read Goethe's poems to her in bed. So she sort of lays there with like this blissed out look on her face hearing these poems. And uh, my dad asked, finally, how's, you know, how's her German? How's this Austrian student's German? My grandmother just said, not so good. <laughs> Which says a lot about my grandma. I mean, my dad said that this reminded him of a time that he had come home from junior high school, um, having taken his first beginning German lessons, uh, and he tried to speak to his mom in her native tongue. She knows seven languages, or, uh, or knows at least a good deal of seven languages, three or four fluently. Um, and he tried to speak to his mom in German for the first time, and she slapped his face. I said, I won't have that gutter German in my house. Because the textbooks he'd been given were these repurposed, they'd been GI manuals that were handed out to soldiers in wartime, and they'd been repurposed as textbooks. So she said, you know, that was gutter German. I guess she found it coarse. Um, but, you know, certain words couldn't be spoken in their house growing up. Certain stories couldn't be told. They were told obliquely. So I would write um, to my grandparents on a typewriter. I, I got a typewriter at garage sale. And, that would be what we would talk about, was the typewriter itself. Um, I knew that my grandmother had survived the Holocaust, that she'd gone seven years not knowing whether any other members of her family had survived. She only found out after the war when she was uh, in an American uh, army outpost in Livorno, Italy, that her sister had survived and she met up with her in St. Louis, and that's how we get to St. Louis. Um, I knew that she had taught herself English in about a year or a little bit less. But Grandma always expressed interest in the letters themselves, in typing itself. And she would talk reverently and rapturously about office work, about having learned to be a typist as a girl. Um, I never knew until my 20s how she, how she had survived the war. Um, but it turned out that, that those typing skills were 
actually what got her through, what let her survive. Um, she was uh, forced into the typing pool in Auschwitz and survived by being a typist. My brother and I recently, uh, on her 90th birthday, we came and she's very frail and we were carrying her into her bedroom, which we've never done before. It was sort of the room that we don't really go into. And we were doing that. We noticed by the side of the bed this pile of letters that we'd never seen before. Most of them were for, from Livorno as she was learning English, as she was recovering, as she was going out, like she was dating, she was engaged to some not grandpa named Otto. <laughs> um, so found, we these like romantic letters about Otto um, and he's Catholic and it's a whole thing. Um, and uh, so you've got actually some extracts on the front page of this handout from those, from those letters that we found. And it's great. My brother works in film, and, and he's just relishing every moment in there where she's talking about going to see like Hitchcock's Notorious and loving it while she's there with the GIs. And, um, and I'm relishing these every moment where she's talking about the typewriter itself. She says, I got your typewriter letter. This is to her sister. And even this is the answer of it. You typed it very well, and I must tell you that I was very glad to read that you were working in an office learning bookkeeping and so far. And I'm pretty sure that you like it because office work is very interesting. I did it almost my whole life since I left school, as you remember, till the war was over. Now I'm worrying all the time what I'll do when I'll be in the States is without knowing the English language perfectly, it's pretty hard to begin somewhat. I will see that I can't help it now, so I have to wait till I'll be there and we'll think it over. I mean, you can see her English is already pretty good. Another one, which I just like for the sort of strangeness of the way that she begins it twice. My dearest little sister, this is the letter I'll type on the typewriter, which I wrote last Sunday while in bed. I'm taking the opportunity that I'm in bed to write you. <laughs> <laughs> Requotes herself. Finding this out, finding out that she, that some connection to this writing machine was what had really saved her life was something that hit me as if I, I prophesied it by being as interested as I was in typewriters. And one of the ways that I got to the project that I'm working on and, and the things that I'm interested in, uh, and, and right now uh, a class I'm teaching on writing under constraint, is through just an obsession with poetry and its relation to uh, new media. I was, I was really uh, bowled over when I was in college by a book that I really recommend to you, Friedrich, Friedrich Kittler's Gramophone Film Typewriter. Um, where he examines the effects of new media technologies on literature and the body at the end of the 19th century. Um, here's what he writes about one of the social effects of the typewriter right at the beginning of that chapter. It says, an innocuous device, an intermediate thing, between a tool and a machine, almost quotidian and hence unnoticed, has made history. The typewriter cannot conjure up anything imaginary, as can cinema. It cannot simulate the real, as can sound recording. It inverts the gender of writing. In so doing, however, it inverts the material basis of literature. The monopoly of script and serial data processing was a privilege of men. Because orders and poems were processed through the same channel, security protocols evolved. Even though more and more women were taught letters in the wake of a general education reform, being able to read was not the same as being allowed to write. Prior to the invention of the typewriter, all poets, secretaries, and typesetters were of the same sex. As late as 1859, when the solidarity of the American women, American women's unions created positions for female typesetters, their male colleagues on the presses boycotted the printing of unmanly type fonts. Only the Civil War of 1861 to 64, that revolutionary media network of telegraph cables and parallel train tracks, opened the bureaucracy of government of male and stenography to writing women. Their numbers, of course, were as yet too small to register to statistically. But he has a chart of the percentage of stenographers and typists in the United States by sex. 1870, there are 147 men and seven women. By 1930, there are 36,000 men and 775,000 women. So it goes from 4.5% of the total uh, employed as stenographers and typists to 95.6%. My grandmother's survival was in some way connected to the availability that this technology granted to uh, to women being in office work. Um, I've come across various accounts of what the typing pool was like in Auschwitz. Um, SS officers saying that uh, typists were allowed three mistakes a day um, or death would follow. 
12 hour shifts, typing thousands of reports in quadruplicate. We found in the packet of letters forms, unfilled out forms from Auschwitz, which was horrifying, but it's all the stranger than and all the more powerful to me that when she's describing her experience of office work in this letter, after the war, she's still relishing the kind of life and power that it gave to her. And the hardest thing for me is to imagine that under the situation of duress and torture, she found some kind of strange pleasure in the things that had given her pleasure when she was young, the ability to, um, to type, to write her linguistic skills, to employ those. Among the things that I read, so I got just fascinated by typewriter art and typewriter poems and these statements about what the typewriter does to the human body. You can see on the second page, I've got a quotation from Heidegger that I bristled at the first time I ever saw it, and I bristle at every time I see it. <laughs> he said, and this is in an essay on the relationship of the hand, of handwriting, to typography, 1942. The typewriter veils the essence of writing and of the script. It withdraws from man the essential rank of the hand without man's experiencing this withdrawal appropriately and recognizing that it has transformed the relation of being to his essence. The typewriter is a signless cloud i.e. a withdrawing concealment in the midst of its very obtrusiveness, and through it, the relation of being to man is transformed. Against Heidegger, let's pitch Sherlock Holmes, who in 1891, and this is a couple of years after the, the mass production of the first typewriters, is saying it's a curious thing that a typewriter has really quite as much individuality as a man's handwriting. Unless they are quite new, no two of them write exactly alike. Some letters get more worn than others, and some wear only on one side. This was around the time that I started discovering how much archives would mean to my work, how much evidence there could be in, in letters, and looking at the things that only belatedly came to me as an archive of my actual family that sort of pushed me into looking at these things. I became fascinated by a lot of 20th century poets like Charles Olson, who in his essay, Projective Verse, really kicks back against this notion that the typewriter is simply a mechanism through which a voice might be filtered. And the invention of the typewriter really was a kind of crisis in the epistemology of authorship, right? Because suddenly you could produce a document that had no connection to the uh, idiosyncrasies of handwriting. You could mass produce and ditto and Xerox copies. You see this being a kind of crisis in like Dracula, for instance, right? Where there's just suddenly a typewriter allows these copies to proliferate like vampires. Um, against that, poets who are using the restrictions of mechanisms, using the restrictions of technology to imitate something like breath or something like life. Charles Olson writes, it's the advantage of the typewriter that due to its rigidity and its space precisions, it can for the poet indicate exactly the breath, the pause, the suspensions even of syllables, the juxtapositions even of parts or phrases which he intends. For the first time, the poet has the stave and the bar a musician has had. For the first time, he can, without the convention of rhyme and meter, record the listening he has done to his own speech, and by that one act indicating how he would want any reader, silent or otherwise, to voice his work. On the last page, you can see some examples of the kind of poetry that typewriting or mechanical print yields up. Apollinaire's famous calligram, The Rains, where he has the words cascading concretely down the page. There's something incredibly linguistically democratizing, I think, about the possibility that even if you can't read this in French, there's an immediacy to the visibility and what you can take from this. Um, and of course, this has precedents going back to like George Herbert. If any of you know his poem, Easter Wings, the poem is shaped like uh, angel's wings or like an hourglass on the page. Um, but so I became fascinated by these. I became fascinated by Aram Saroyan, who has invented. Can anyone pronounce this Aram Saroyan poem for me? Mm. It works for me. Yeah. It's both impossible and completely natural, the, the sort of delectation sound that we're supposed to make in response to this visual icon on the page. Um, and so the, the class that I'm teaching now, when I was, you know, coming here brand new and asked what classes I might teach for the freshman writing seminar, the thing that occurred to me was this writing under constraint, where we're looking at the idea that um, 
against notions of genius or poems coming to you in dreams or um, poems being inspired by the muses, which surely they are, but sometimes it's a mechanical muse. Sometimes it's a, a sort of bracket you put on yourself or a shackle that you can then uh, you know, break out of, like Houdini. One of the ways that you might do this, there's this form called the lipogram, which is a text that leaves out one letter. So Georges Perec has a novel called, uh, in French, La Disparation, or it's been translated into English as a void, where the letter E is never used once in the text. So just tape down one key on your typewriter or your keyboard and try and write without that at all. You get an example here from Christian Book, from his book Eunoia, where it's a series of chapters, this prose poem, where he takes uh, each chapter is in the key of one of the vowels. So here is chapter I. Writing is inhibiting. Sighing, I sit, scribbling in ink this pigeon script. I sing with nihilistic witticism, disciplining signs with trifling gimmicks. Impish hijinks with highlight stick sigils. Isn't it glib? Isn't it chic? I fit childish insights within rigid limits, writing shtick which might instill priggish misgivings in critics blind with hindsight. I dismiss nitpicking criticism which flirts with philistinism. I bitch, I kibitz, griping whilst criticizing dimwits, sniping whilst in indicting nitwits, dismissing simplistic thinking in which philippic wit is still illicit. It's kind of amazing, right? The sound that comes out of this, what it happens when you isolate a letter in that way and, and focus on it. I mean, he gave himself even more constraints, but recommend looking up that, uh, that book. As far as my project, I'm, I'm working on a book about long poems of place, what it means for a poet to stay in one place for a really long time and write about that place. Because if you do that, if you look out the window for 20 years, which again, I don't fully recommend as a literal practice, but you know, it could be nice. If you do that, the world that you're seeing out the window will change. So the idea of staying local itself changes across the period of these long poems that were written over a period of decades. Um, what got me there was a typewriter poem, which is A.R. Ammons, Roger Gilbert is the world expert on random biography, um, uh, Cornelian. Um, Tape for the Turn of the Year was a, a long poem that he wrote, which I can imagine both my grandma and grandpa would have loved. He took a roll of adding machine tape, 100 feet long, spooled it through a typewriter, and said, I'm going to write a long, thin poem on this tape, and I'm not going to stop until it's out. Parts of it are epic, parts of it are him listing what he had for lunch, but the idea of, um, and parts of it are elegiac, He's lamenting the fact that he has to stay in the one place and that rather than writing elegies, say, I got, I got really interested in elegies and just read a ton of these poems of mourning uh, after my grandfather passed away. So I was reading elegies, which are occasional, right? Someone dies, you write a poem in commemoration or mourning or, or melancholy, uh, inability to complete your mourning out of that. Um, in a poem like this, the idea of staying in one place or staying bound to this machine means that elegies kind of come to you. So the first thing I had towards this idea of what it means to stay in place or be tethered to a particular place and what kind of liberatory possibilities there are in that came out of this long poem, which I think the archive has the manuscript of this, right? The typescript? Oh, yes. The roll is there. Roll. We're feet from the actual roll on which he did this. So go check it out. <clears throat> um, but the other part of my title that I gave today, with Poetry in the Home Key, is just to think about um, the kind of fertile metaphorics of the keyboard itself, right? The QWERTY design, which looks like someone spilled the alphabet on it, or the return key, which means carriage return, the barrel that moves back and forth. On some typewriters, it says home, as if the left margin is home. And so Ammons, as he's imagining this machine as a kind of anchor to his place, is also thinking constantly of hitting a button that says home on it and returning again and again. So ultimately, what I'm finding as I'm teaching this class on writing under constraint is that it leads pretty naturally to this rapprochement between my grandfather's sense that poetry comes from dreams and my grandmother's sense that poetry might come out of um, a free play within dire constraints. We did uh, just last week uh, some surrealist games. Has anyone here, just show of hands, played Exquisite Corpse? Action. Perfect. Sorry. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I kind of want to ask if we could maybe do exquisite corpses. Is that, 
weird or are we out of time? Or, yeah? Okay. Yeah. We might not have enough time. Okay, so the practice of the exquisite corpse is you get in a group, do this. It's amazing. Um, each person writes a line that follows a kind of Mad Libs template, right? The noun, uh, the adjective noun, adverb, verb, the adjective noun. So the exquisite corpse sadly drinks the new wine. You then give to the next person without showing them your line one of the pieces that they have to use. So say one of my nouns that I used is also the noun you'll use. And so on and so on. And then you put them together. And what comes out of it are these poems that are fully a product of constraint, fully a product of, of submitting to the kind of will of this mechanism. But at the same time, they sound like your dreams. They make a strange kind of sense. The class that I did this with, I'm, I'm asking them, and they were like, we're doing this, submitting them to literary journals. <laughs> they're actually really great. Um, There's a journal called The Exquisite Corpse. Is there? Yes. Perfect. Excellent. They were making up, they were like, well, who do we sign it under? And that's part of the point, right? That the idea of authorship is made collective, is denatured, is it's impossible to know quite where it's all coming from if it's not from some collective unconscious above. Um, so they were coming up with anagrams for my name. <laughs> all right, um, Gorge something, appropriately enough for Ithaca. Um, but yeah, so I, I suppose, I know on the, I just noticed on the thing that was sent out, it said that I would read some of my poems. Those don't exist. I have, I have my grandparents' poems here to talk about. I, I wrote poems all through college. I would send those back and forth, but those, we'll leave those for my grandpa at this point. Um, and yeah, that's kind of my spiel. So um, if anyone has any questions or, or thoughts about these very strange poems or um, stories you want to share about the stories you were told as children, any of that would be welcome. Yeah, right. Roger. The new follow-up on, on the animals, because it's so interesting what you're mm -hmm. hearing about the presence of ecology in that book. Um, you know, one of the really odd things about that book is that, or that poem, is that he wrote it around the time of the assassination of JFK, and it's not mentioned anywhere in it. No, yeah. Which, and I think that has something to do with that sense of the local, that if he had mm -hmm. introduced this huge national tragedy, yeah. it would have broken the frame, it would have move the focus in a way that was beyond, you know, recovery. Absolutely, yeah. There's, I mean, and he has an elegy for Kennedy that's shorter that appears in this anthology called Poems on, um, Poems, what is it called? It's a, it's a book of elegies compiled about Kennedy's assassination. And in that, he talks about, it's a sort of riff on, on uh, Whitman's When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloom. It's about the cortege, the, the funeral train winding its way through, but he describes it as a black ribbon of grief. So I think he's thinking about the typewriter as a technology of mourning, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a way in which um, the idea of writing a long, like a poem that seems endless but actually isn't, has this really interesting cognate. If you look at the, um, the Eternal Flame, you know, so you go to Arlington, there's the Eternal Flame. When they were installing that, there's a newspaper article that appeared in the Times where it said um, they have installed a temporary Eternal Flame, <laughs> which I just love as an <laughs> image, right? Um, this poem seems to me, in some ways, a, a temporary eternal flame. Do I say, yeah, I, although now I get called a hipster all the time for it. Like, everyone's like, this is, oh, you oh, obsolete technology and stuff. But I have, I have like, I have like five of them at home. I almost brought one here, but it was just too heavy to, to lug in because I wanted to let you guys play around with it if you wanted to. Um, and then once my mom knew that I was into typewriters, she started just buying them for me everywhere. So I have, at her house, like 20 typewriters. Yeah. And she's always like, you gotta take your typewriter collection. I'm like, I had what typewriter collection? She opened a closet, it was like Blackbeard's closet. She was, or Bluebeard's closet, it was like some beard's closet. There were just typewriters in there. It's like, oh my God. So yeah, I do. Um, I mean, it's harder to get the ink ribbons, but I, if anyone's interested, I got a guy in California. So. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I'm just, so I asked my dad, like an electric, mm -hmm. and that was like not what I wanted. But I ended up being really, I thought it was really cool, and I liked to play on it occasionally. But yeah. do you have like a particular typewriter that you use? I, I have to write lipograms now because my favorite typewriter got dusty from about a year of 
not using it, and then I was vacuuming the dust and it sucked up the L key, <laughs> which for my own name is really bad. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's an electric Remington that I've used for a while. Um, I've got, uh, just if people want to pass around, like, um, this book, Typewriter Art, it's fun. Um, there's this great book of, um, there was a whole generation in the 60s and 70s in Scotland who started writing pattern and concrete poems. Um, so there's this tiny little anthology of Scottish concrete poems, which I'll pass around as well. And wants to look through. They're really fun, what you can do with the, the typewriter. So yeah, I mean, I sort of play around with all of them. Another really good thing to do is if you have a typewriter and you have a party, just leave it out with some paper in it. And at the end of the night, you will have the weirdest document <laughs> in the world. And so I was just up in John Lennon's office, and he has a whole bunch of typewriters, yeah. including a lot of manual ones, lined up on the shelves, and he was telling me that he'd written drafts of various novels on different, on different typewriters, so I'm assuming he'd probably been in his office. And That's awesome, yeah. I mean, Henry James, Henry James, his late novels, he would dictate to a, a typist, um, Bo Sang Kei, what's her last name? And he, at one point, the typewriter had to be repaired, and he couldn't write because they got an electric silent typewriter in, and he said that he was speaking Remingtonese. Like he got so used to dictating with this clatter, the clack, 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 mm -hmm. of the typewriter, that when that disappeared, he said that it was like he was speaking into a void. There was nothing coming back to him. So this is another thing that's worth trying: is dictating something while someone's typing. But yeah, I should. Um, I, I, it's the first I've seen this Heidegger quote. Yeah. And, um, it's interesting. You mentioned it in like the of your grandma, and so and I was thinking about something the German language poet Paul Salon yes. said about only um, only true hand write true poetry, and mm -hmm. I, I I was I always thought he means this literally, yeah, um, and he was very interested in, in handwriting and so forth, mm -hmm. and. Um, the idea of, uh, and you know, Heidegger is a figure that Salon sort of wrestles with. Yeah. Um, and I, I just wondered if you ever thought about that, though. The idea of, uh, of, of, I don't know, he uses, uh, Heidegger uses the word essence here, essence writing that is veiled by the type, typewriter. Um, if there's anything veiled, really, or if, if, if you would agree or challenge this idea that Salon has about true hand writing, true poetry. I mean, you still have to have two true hands going on a typewriter. It also sort of frees up the hand in a way. This is maybe a riff off of what you're asking rather than actually wrestling with the sort of complication of what true means in that sense. Yeah. Well, my grandfather would handwrite poems to me. The aura of those is astonishing, having his handwriting. But at the end of his life, when he couldn't, he couldn't write as well, he would do what William Cross Williams did at the end of his life. If you look at his late letters, He's there having William Cross Williams towards the end of his life had a series of strokes that were debilitating. And he would peck out one letter at a time. You get the sense of this immense effort to continue with the voice. And that's something I always associate with Salon's poetry as well, the, the sheer labor that's required to, to speak and the need for new words or a sort of denaturing of, of German or of English when we translate Salon. Um, into neologisms or um, compound words or sort of invented vocabularies. I don't know. What do you? Th how do you? Do you write by hand? Do you write? Do you type? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. I think there's some things that have. I mean, like there are some things that. This is very. It's always very personal, but. I don't know. Childhood. Yeah. And I like to see how the paper changes, and I can do. I can also, in a way, sort of doodle around, which I don't know if it's possible with the, the typewriter. I like what you said. I never thought of it of uh, typing uh, or taking out the key or covering off the key, so you're restricted. Yeah. But say, just the the way that you're mapping a poem or whatever it might be, um, while you're creating it. Mm -hmm. you know? I, I don't know if that's available on the typewriter. Olson would say that some version of it was, but it's also for him something like a musical stave, so it's still yeah. a, a grid or a matrix. He talks about composition by field, meaning that the page for him was suddenly a kind of canvas that the typewriter could move all across and that visually the poem could be something 
like a concrete poem, but also in that a representation of these very biological, natural, um, not to reify what's natural or bodily, but um, factors, right? So for him, it was that the page was fully opened by the typewriter. But I know that, uh, you know, it's, it's different when we're working on word processor, like when you're working on word, yeah. it totally changes. You don't have that impress of the paper. Typewriters were marketed a lot of the time as being this innovation of the, the writing just spontaneously coming in perfect type, like a book was producing itself in front of you. <laughs> so that immediacy was a huge shock of, of its initial appearance, that anyone could be producing something legible to anyone. But yeah, I mean, something is That's lost in here. what I was <coughs> wondering if, sorry, we're not no, talking no. about too much, but um, so a lot of people are scared of the, the privacy of a handwriting in, in that it's uh, working for something we, we could write the same way, you know that? Yeah. Uh, well, but we possibly could type the same way. Uh, yeah. We probably have the same strength and, and so forth. So I don't know, it's as if your handwriting is, is, is somewhat, as I think of poetry, uh, private and belonging to one sort of lyric voice. I think just the archivist in me is on Sherlock Holmes' side, right? Which is that there's a certainly way of reading typography that's unifi uniform, right? But that it, in a way, requires an even closer attention from us to what the differences of situation, ink, and impress, and paper source are. Um, and you know, all of those St. Louis writers I was obsessed with. Later, I would have encounters with their typography. William Burroughs doing cut-ups, where he was taking typed sheets and, and you know, just literally cutting them up and mixing them together. Or T. S. Eliot's Wasteland drafts; those are beautiful to look at. They produced a facsimile of his drafts of the Wasteland, and if you look at it, it's the the typescript still has a certain kind of aura about it, in part because it has those hand-written emendations on it from from him and from, his, from Valerie Elliott, his wife, and from Ezra Pound. Um, so you see these cross-throughs and uh, scribbles and doodles and Pound saying that Elliott was too tum pum at a stretch, meaning that he was being too constantly rhythmic in one part. Does anyone here handwrite? Do you type? Does anyone have typewriters? And what's your sense of this, of what we're talking about here? I <laughs> I mean, I think, I think that there's a certain, like, I guess I, I write, and I, I don't use a typewriter, I've never typed on a typewriter in my life, but obviously I use a computer and they write by hand. And one of the things I like is that I do feel like it kind of removes itself. When it's not in your own script, it sort of is like hanging out there looking back at you. And it's, I've had like whole evenings where I was just like trying to grab on to the poetry again because it feels like it starts to separate sort of. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, I guess I think that there's a time and place for it all, and it's all kind of interesting in some way. Yeah, I mean, I like very much, I print things out as I'm working on drafts. Um, so I like having that sense of it being estranged from me, and then something that I'm grasping and sort of, you know, just marking up and moving paragraphs around and, and fiddling in that way, and then back to a revision that's slightly distant from me. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think like um, I have a tendency to type on computer also, and that's solely because like I, I can't handwrite as fast as I can type, and mm. it's usually so when you're like trying to get as much as possible, uh, um, uh, that's that's what I do. Um, yeah. But also like recently I've been like uh, I've been using um, all capitals a lot more because I want it to feel heavier and I want it to feel like um, I don't want, I just want something more and I can't get it from a very thin laptop keyboard. So yeah. that's really interesting. Right, and if that was online, it would be like you're screaming all the time. Yeah. Right? But, <laughs> but no, I mean, there's there's something very personal about our relationship to font, to typography, to all those things. Yeah. Yeah. I was just gonna say that um, after typing on a typewriter, I find my thoughts are almost very like staccato y in mm -hmm. a way too. I just feel more choppy. And I said I was talking to my dad after typing something. I said I feel like I'm just talking to you like very like short little spurts of words. And mm. he said, Yeah, I noticed you're speaking differently. And it's kind of cool 
to try that and just like see how it changes what you're writing and also what you're saying and how you're yeah. thinking. Yeah, the rhythm of it is really phenomenal. I mean, the, the idea of writing that could keep up with the speed of thought is part of the dynamic of the, the way that typewriter mediation is both sold and, and sort of thought about in its, early, in its infancy. Um, there's a great boom to that, but it also very quickly gets likened to, uh, to war technology. I mean, Remington, which was making rifles where you could interchange the parts, also kind of immediately got in the typewriting game. And the sound of it is likened to rifles. Right? Um, there's certainly that aspect as well. When I think of my grandma's typing and, and that as a mode of survival, the idea of the typewriter being used as a, as a weapon, as something that was, she was indentured to, was um, is also there, but I think it's interesting to kind of keep both aspects in play. You know, something that could keep up with thought, as if anything could. Um, something maybe closer to the speed of thought, and uh, and something that is this immense situation of duress on thinking. Okay. Yeah. It would be fascinating to actually have students then write certain essays with handwriting mm -hmm. and the typewriter and the computer and to think <laughs> write about how our writing is shaped by these different forms. Yeah. 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 Right? Because I do, I think, um, so I, like you guys, I'm drawn, I have a typewriter, I'm drawn to it. It's, for me, it's the, so immediately when I hear the gun reference to the sound of the typewriter, it hurts so much because I love, you know, the aesthetics of the typewriter because yeah. it's a different I mean, musical flow, you know, it's that, Different sound. I mean, it's also percussive. It's it's related. It's related in all those early sort of accounts to um, to something like uh, a new instrument for a symphony, and they're indeed like surrealists who put the typewriter as an instrument in their. Absolutely, but you know, also great. What I was thinking about earlier when you and I were having your exchange, I love what you when you were reminding us that hands are actually on, you know, obviously on the typewriter because then when we think about handwriting, yeah, for me when I'm thinking about now hands on the pen. So it's the notion of the grip. Yeah. Right? So it's not only the impress, mm -hmm. but also right when we think about our writing, right? What we're trying to do when we're handwriting, right? Yeah. As opposed to using a typewriter or a computer. I'm thinking now about the grip. Mm -hmm. It's the way we grip that insurance. You know, yeah. so yeah. it's still right. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that, that I've just suddenly realized is that what, I mean, it's obvious that you type with both hands and you write with only one hand. And mm -hmm. You know, I'm finding myself thinking about neuroscience, the left brain and right brain, whether the yeah. use of two hands subtly changes the way your, your brain is actually um, uh, relating to the process. Absolutely. There's a, if I can just read a very short other passage from uh, Kittler, he talks about that. He says, when from the point of view of brain physiology, language works as a feedback loop of mechanical relays, the construction of typewriters is only a matter of course. Nature the most pitiless experimenter paralyzes certain parts of the brain through strokes and bullet wounds to the head. Research, since the Battle of Solferno in 1859, is only required to measure the resulting interferences in order to distinguish the distinct subroutines of speech in an anatomically precise way. Sensory aphasia while hearing, dyslexia while reading, expressive aphasia while speaking, agraphia while writing, bring forth machines in the brain. Right, so the sort of disruptions of neural pathways can also then be mapped onto the technologies that might recuperate different forms of speaking. A little machine? That was Williams. Williams. Yeah, in his preface to the Wedge from '44, right at the time of the war effort, he says that the poem is a little machine made up of words. Yeah. Oh, um, I'm also someone who likes to write by hand, but when we're talking about this, I, I keep thinking about uh, sort of guitars because uh, mm -hmm. it's also something that uh, produces like you know, musical sound, but uh, a lot of guitarists will tell you that like different guitars, you know, widely vary. You know, they sort of will want to be played in a different way um, based on the way they're constructed. And so I think it's interesting thinking about that, the typewriter. Yeah, absolutely. When um, uh, Luis Urea was here, doing the reading, he talked about how the typewriter he had as a kid was one with the black ribbon and the red ribbon conjoined, and that his, it was slightly off, so that when he would type his beautiful description of it was like the, the tops of the letters would be in red, and it was like they were sort of catching fire at the top. Mm -hmm. There's something very specific about how these things work. And also, if you look at um, 
Tristan Zara's description of how to write a Dadaist poem. It's, it's a cognate of those early punk scenes where it's saying, here's three, learn these three chords, start a band. It's saying anyone can do this. Like, these technologies are sort of available to anyone. You can make yourself a genius by playing up the, uh, playing within the constraints. Yeah, Sana. Uh, what I also find really interesting about typewriters and writing by hand as opposed to writing the laptop is the right, like when you're writing, there's a lot of self-doubt involved and when you're typing on the laptop, at least with me, it goes control A, delete, control A, delete, and it's mm -hmm. just lost. But as opposed to when you're writing with hand or when you're writing on a typewriter and when you're not happy with your sentences and your words, you yeah. strike a line to them, but you can come back to that maybe two weeks later and be like, oh, that works. Yeah. So it's more of, a pro more of an ongoing process as opposed to something that is always lost when you delete it on a laptop, which I find interesting. Yeah, absolutely. When you look at archives of poets after the typewriter is sort of phased out, the, the drafts, and the, the evidence we have of those changes, they're less because you're able to edit within the document in a way that's much harder when you have to kind of retype the whole thing over and over again. So, yeah. Yeah, I have that experience too. I mean, I'm just moving pieces around and deleting and, and thank God, I mean, that way no one has to see some of the sentences that I come up with. One poet, print out your... Yeah, give us archives. And, and, and so we, can, we archivists can, can see them. We, we, we don't want to lose that. at the end of our time, but I feel like we want to thank you and maybe talk informally a little bit if people don't have class immediately afterwards. Can we like applaud for Greg? <laughs> thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank this has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.